All right, good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening for a presentation of North Shore Wildlife with the North Shore Black Bear Society. Uh, before we get started, just a few Zoom items tonight. Uh, we will be using the automatically transcribed closed caption feature for the hearing impaired. To enable or disable the closed captions, you can select the live transcript option on your menu. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the program. You can uh, type these questions into the Q&A feature on your menu. You may also use the Q&A feature if you need any technical support. And we will not be using the chat or the raise hand features. I do recognize that we're all in different places this evening, but I would like to acknowledge that for those of us on the North Shore, we are on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations. Uh, I personally am incredibly grateful to live in these beautiful lands that we share with so much amazing wildlife. Uh, the Coast Salish peoples have been the careful caretakers of these lands since time immemorial. They have always lived peacefully with the wildlife, and uh, I strive to learn from these teachings and be respectful of all the creatures that we share this land with. Uh, I am so delighted this evening to welcome Lucy Cadman, who is the Executive Director of the North Shore Black Bear Society, and I will turn it over to Lucy. Uh, thank you so much, Kendra, and thank you very much um, to West Vancouver Library for hosting uh, this presentation tonight. Very grateful. And I would like to just acknowledge that the North Shore Black Bear Society uh, acknowledges and thanks the Coast Salish people whose traditional unceded territory the North Shore resides on. And it's a privilege to live and work in this space. I'm here uh, from uh, with you from Deep Cove uh, this evening. And uh, I do want to share as well um, that uh, I'm very proud to share photographs this evening that have been taken by my friend Tony Joyce, who's an ethical wildlife photographer. It's very, very important to me. Uh, so we do hope that you enjoy the presentation and the beautiful photographs that you shared with us. Uh, so the North Shore Black Bear Society, we work in partnership with all three North Shore municipalities and we are active year round providing education on the best practices for sharing the habitat with black bears and we've been around for around 15 years and about five years ago I expanded our program to cover basic information on other wildlife that people had lots of questions about. So tonight our main focus will be our beautiful black bears but we'll also be talking about coyotes and cougars and the best practices for sharing the space with those animals. Uh, so the North Shore Black Bear Society promotes responsible coexistence. We want to make sure that people feel happy and comfortable living in black bear habitat, exploring in black bear habitat, and of course we want to reduce the number of human-caused black bear deaths on the North Shore and across BC. Uh, so the North Shore Black Bear Society maintains a website, just created a new website last summer with lots of information and lots of wonderful photographs. So do take a look on our website. And if you see any wildlife in the community or on the trails, I really like to know um, who's moving around, where, at what time of year. That helps me to collect uh, very valuable data, um, which helps me with uh, educational outreach. And it can also help with potentially trail closures in areas where we need to protect our wildlife. So if you see a coyote, a cougar, a bear or a bobcat, uh, please let us know. You can call or text the number on the screen here. That's my direct cell. Or you can go to our website and make that report. Um, I also maintain social media. So I'm putting out lots of information on Facebook and Instagram, occasionally on Twitter. Um, so what we like to do throughout the season is let people know what our bears are up to and their seasonal habits what's going on on the North Shore and what's happening uh, to bears across British Columbia. Because uh, certainly where we are in BC, we have more bears than anywhere else in Canada. And uh, it's a wonderful privilege to share the North Shore with these magnificent animals. We hope that uh, you enjoy uh, living in bear country too. Uh, some other initiatives that we do uh, to increase our outreach when every when anybody makes a report to us via text or on the phone or through email, we will send uh, a PDF with some basic information on the best practices for living in bear habitat. So how we can reduce attracting bears to our homes and exploring in bear habitat, the best uh, practices for trail use and some information too on basic bear behavior 
and very importantly, what to do during an encounter. And uh, we encourage that information to go out to block watch captains and, and the wider community. We'll also respond to reports made from schools and we'll ask the elementary schools and the high schools to issue this information to all teachers and families. And that really helps us to get the information out there too. Uh, we do write to everybody that buys a house on the North Shore and we welcome them to Bear Country. So every year we welcome about a thousand new residents and uh, in that welcome letter they'll learn about the bylaws that we have. Uh, so we've got very strong bylaws um, in the district of North Vancouver and the district of West Vancouver in particular. They're our most active areas for bear activity. Uh, lets people know what time they can put their garbage out and such and just gives an overall idea of what it's like to share the landscape with these animals. Some other things that we do you may have seen around the community uh, every year we visit thousands of homes and leave educational material that might be proactively in the late winter and early spring based on the previous year's activity or reactively such as our bear in area hangars. Uh, it's a great opportunity to meet bears in the community as well where we're out uh, canvassing and of course to speak to residents and answer any questions that they might have. We also place signage in the community, so in the district of North Vancouver and the city of North Vancouver, the, the society is responsible for placing that signage. In West Vancouver, we facilitate that signage with your parks department. Uh, so just made the first request for signage today uh, in West Vancouver in the Caulfield community. Uh, not too surprising, but um, bears are starting to emerge from their dens earlier and earlier every year. And uh, it was just this time last year that I had the first bear report from Eagle Harbor in West Vancouver. Um, so this time uh, it's a, a single bear in the Caulfield area that's already been sighted. Uh, so it's been a very, very mild winter and uh, due to unnatural food sources being available as well, things like bird seed and garbage, uh, that does contribute to a longer season of bear activity here on the North Shore. Um, so bears are going to be out and about very soon and uh, at least one that we know of and I'm sure some more that haven't been reported or perhaps haven't been seen yet. So it's uh, the perfect time to be talking about these animals. Uh, just a quick overview. Uh, so this is just a, a screen grab of the number of signs that were placed across the North Shore last year. This is just for bear activity. We do place signage too for coyotes and cougars. Uh, so we placed over 300 signs all across the North Shore. Uh, even in the city of North Vancouver, we get activity on Central Lonsdale, Lower Lonsdale now in the Queensbury area. Uh, we get activity at the Auto Mall, um, down at the beach in Deep Cove and all across West Vancouver. Um, so bears uh, travel extensively in search of food. That's one of their motivations. So that would be natural foods, the beautiful salmon berries, the dandelions that we have around the community, the clover. And then our natural foods, things like pet food, barbecue grease, the bird feeders, they're a really strong attractant at this time of year. Uh, so food is a big motivation. Um, and you'll see that the bears move uh, through uh, wildlife corridors to so the green spaces that travel uh, through residential areas. They'll travel through creeks and rivers. Many animals will use those spaces uh, to avoid people as much as possible. Uh, the other motivation for bears living in areas closer to people. So typically what happens is the bears live on the periphery of our urban environments and then they come down into residential areas. But we do have some bears that will den, uh, so make their winter home very, very close to residential areas, occasionally on vast um, properties as well. We've seen that before uh, in West Vancouver, down where I am in Deep Cove, we've seen that. Um, so the motivation um, to live on the periphery of an urban environment for a bear is actually safety. Um, so very often the bears that we see on our busy trails during the daytime and in the community are the vulnerable population of bears. So that vulnerable population would be female bears with their cubs, our juveniles, our teenage bears, our bears that are injured and our very old bears. Uh, now those bears are seeking safety from dominant bears who are a danger to them. Those dominant bears, the, the adult male bears, typically live um, further away from people. Uh, they, they occupy the best habitats and they're most active at night. 
and that forces these vulnerable bears to seek safety um, living closer to people and by being active during the daytime. So that's very often why we see bears in the community as well. So many of the bears that we'll see um, in residential areas, not always, uh, but there are juveniles and we do get lots of mums and cubs as well, especially in West Vancouver. Um, so that just covers a little bit about why we see bears in the community. It's not just uh, food sources that they're after, um, it's safety as well. And uh, we see that when we see uh, young bears denning very close to residential areas. We've had situations before where uh, females have given birth to cubs um, in dens very, very close to popular trails. And that is to seek safety from those dominant bears who are a danger to them. Uh, so the bears that we have living here on the North Shore, we've got one species, the North American black bear. Uh, this is the most common uh, bear species in British Columbia. It's thought that we've got about 120, 130,000 black bears, but let me tell you that nobody's actually doing research on the numbers, so it really is a guesstimate. Uh, but it's thought that we've got a healthy population. Um, and then brown bears or grizzly bears. So no grizzly bears in the wild on the North Shore. We've got Grinder and Cooler up at Grouse Mountain, uh, but across other parts of BC, there are around 10,000 grizzly bears. Um, so when it comes to grizzly bear habitat, they really don't live too far away. If you go to Squamish or Whistler or head east to Manning Park, that becomes grizzly and black bear habitat. But the only bear that you'll see at the moment on the North Shore in the wild is a black bear. Um, now we of course never encourage people to get close to these animals. It's great if you like to go out onto the trails um, and up into the mountains, take a pair of binoculars, you can then get a really good view from a safe distance without encroaching on their personal space too. Um, but just some ways to tell uh, what bear you're encountering. Perhaps you've gone to the back country of Whistler uh, for a hike and you see a bear. Uh, well you might think to look at the colour uh, but in fact, uh, both of these bears can have black fur, they can be dark brown, light brown, they can be blonde, they can be a red cinnamon colour, and very rarely they can both be white as well. So we look at other physical characteristics. Uh, something very noticeable about a grizzly bear that a black bear doesn't have is the big hump on their shoulder. And that's all muscle. And that's muscle to help those grizzly bears turn over rocks to look for grubs and to help them dig. Grizzly bears love to dig. Now a grizzly bear's claws are up to 11 centimeters long and they're actually quite straight and they're designed not for climbing but for deep precise digging. They'll dig for ground squirrels, they'll dig for the roots of plants, uh, they'll actually use that shoulder muscle and those long claws as well to dig their winter den. So grizzly bears like to live in wide open spaces, think estuaries, alpine meadows, and they also make their winter home at higher elevations. Um, up in the subalpine, what they'll do is they'll dig a tunnel and a chamber into the side of the mountain, and bears are like cats, they can squeeze into small spaces. They'll then squeeze into that space uh, for the winter period. Now black bear claws are very different. Now black bears evolved in forested areas and they're very very agile climbers and that's thanks to their excellent claws. They've got five very short sharp curved claws on each paw and uh, black bears are very very comfortable in trees. That's their safe place. They prefer forested areas and that's why the North Shore is the perfect place to be a black bear. Other things that we can look for are the ears. Uh, so grizzly bears have got very small rounded ears whereas black bear ears are quite large and pronounced and the face shape as well. Um, a grizzly bear has a dish shape profile whereas a black bear has a very straight nose and muzzle. So just some ways to tell them apart. Um, not always by size, we can have uh, very very large black bears even in the community in North Vancouver and small grizzlies so we look at those other physical characteristics. Uh, so here's an example of the most common colour phase 
is of black bear that we have here on the North Shore. So I mentioned that there could be different colors. Uh, we won't see a white black bear here on the North Shore. Uh, they live in the Great Bear Rainforest and uh, that bear is known as a Komodi bear or a spirit bear, a subspecies of black bear that has white fur due to recessive gene. Uh, but we do get different color phases on the North Shore. The most common, as I said, is this uh, classic black bear uh, with the black fur and the tan muzzle, the tan nose. And uh, other color phases that we see, we see the cinnamon color and uh, very often um, our cinnamon or brown phase black bears live in West Vancouver. We've got a cinnamon bear in the Lynn Valley area at the moment, um, or we did last season, not heard about that bear just yet, um, but most of them seem to be in West Vancouver. And uh, bears have different markings as well. So um, they might have a patch on their chest uh, there was a beautiful bear in West Vancouver last year that had a huge solid white patch on his chest and uh, these are called chest blazers. Bears might have uh, marks on their faces as well around their ears and on their eyebrows and uh, these markings help us to identify individual bears. It can be quite tricky so these blazers really help. Here's another example of uh, a blaze on a bear. See so different shapes and sizes here. And uh, very much what happens is um, most black bear cubs are born with this unique marking on their chest, but they'll often lose them. Um, so bears lose their fur and their fur regrows every year. And so they can change a lot in the first few years of their life. Um, up until about being four or five years old, it's very difficult to identify a bear as an individual because they do change so much in appearance. Uh, they can be, uh, black with this white chest patch one year and the next year their fur is almost all, all brown. Uh, so it can be very tricky to identify all the different individual bears that we've got living here on the North Shore, but we try. Uh, so black bears have got excellent senses. They've got an excellent uh, uh, sense of smell. Uh, in fact, uh, that's their best sense, their best tool. Um, they can smell 2,000 times better than we can. Uh, so bears really trust their nose more than anything else. They've got great eyesight, they can see in color, they see very well at night, uh, they've got great hearing, but until they get a smell of something, they're not really sure what it is. Um, so that's why it's very, very common for bears to stand up um, when they encounter people, when they hear a noise, and that's so they can lift their nose from the ground and get a better sense of what is around them. Now a standing bear isn't an aggressive bear. A standing bear is a curious bear and in fact it's quite common during close encounters, especially if the bear has been surprised, for the bear to stand up for a moment just to use their nose to identify what you are, what the that noise was that's just disturbed them, and also to identify a safe route to leave. Uh, bears typically want to avoid close encounters with people, and usually they will leave. They don't run away, but uh, they'll often just leave. They don't want to get close to people intentionally, uh, but they need to make sure that it's a safe place to leave, especially if it's a young, vulnerable bear. Perhaps you've just surprised a mom and cubs and uh, the mom needs to smell and source out a safe route to leave because there could be another bigger bear close by that we're not aware of. And we could potentially push that family into the path of that bigger bear that would be a danger to those cubs. So when they stand up and they're smelling around and they're moving their head from side to side, that's making sure that they're finding a safe place to leave as well. As I mentioned that we shouldn't expect bears to run away from us and that's because bears aren't fearful and we don't want them to be. We don't want bears to be running through the community, running across roads. Uh, we don't want them to be fearful as well because there are so many people and dogs spending time in their home that if they're afraid of people, they might feel defensive around us. So we don't want to encourage them to get close. We of course don't want to feed them or give them any reason to get close to people intentionally, but we also don't want to make them fearful. We don't want to try and scare them away. And we also make, need to make sure that we don't expect them to run. Um, I think that's one of the big misconceptions about bear behaviors that many people think that if a bear doesn't run away from us, then it's bold and aggressive. Absolutely not. That's just an intelligent animal that understands that if they run every time they see a person, they will get absolutely nothing done. Now, it's very normal for bears to move very slowly through the community, and that's actually a good thing. 
Now, uh, bears, if they do want to run, though, are very, very fast. So we won't win a bear in a running race. They can run at 65 kilometers per hour. Now, we shouldn't run if we encounter wildlife. And uh, it's hard. I understand if, if you're afraid, um, your instinct, isn't it, is to scream and to run away. But we need to go against that instinct and try and stay nice and calm and be very calm with the way that we move our bodies. Whether you meet a bear or a coyote, maybe a cougar, if we run, we could trigger that natural chase instinct that these animals have. It's exceptionally rare for bears to chase people, but we need to make sure that we don't trigger that instinct. It's the same situation as if you were on your bike. Um, you would very slowly dismount and back away from the bear rather than pedaling away really fast because you could just trigger that chase response. As I said, black bears are very comfortable in trees, so look up when you're in the forest. Obviously, there's food in the trees and there's also safety. Um, so often in the summer, um, it's nice and shady up in the tree canopy, so our bears will be snoozing up in the trees. You probably won't even notice them. And uh, as a safety aspect, um, that's one of the first places that a bear will look to go um, during a close encounter with a person or another animal is their safe place, which is in a tree. Um, so they can practically walk up trees. It's, it's very, very impressive to see how agile uh, these bears are at climbing and uh, very rare for a bear to come down a tree if people are close by. Um, so the bear will uh, sit out and, and wait in that safe place for quite some time until everybody's left the area and then they'll feel comfortable to climb down and move on. Uh, so this is why what we don't want to do is we don't want to stand at the base of the tree that's going to stress out the bear um, and we don't want to trap bears especially in the community. Uh, this is what we see quite often and we understand that people love our bears, they want to get photographs but we really need to give them lots of personal space. We should never step into their space but always away. What we do if everybody runs out when there's a bear in the neighborhood and the bear's in the tree, make that bear a really easy target to be killed because you trap that bear in the community. Best thing to do is to get everybody inside, make sure it's nice and quiet, watch from the window, and the bear will feel comfortable enough to climb down and go back into the forest. Uh, so bears um, have been uh, in their dens now for a very short period of time here on the North Shore. Uh, so we have a very long bear season and that's due to mild winters and access to unnatural foods. Uh, so the reason that bears den for the winter period is not because of the cold, it's because of low food availability. Um, so over the winter period they conserve their energy and uh, they hide out in a den. And a uh, den, as I said, could be very close to popular trails, it could be in the community. It's usually uh, the base of a tree, the hollow base of a tree or under an old fallen tree. And again, black bears will use their claws to dig a tunnel and a chamber and uh, they'll spend months preparing these dens, taking lots of materials inside to make a nice comfy mattress. And uh, our bears on the North Shore typically will start to den now around mid-December. And uh, we do hear of bear activity over the winter period. Um, that's typically from male bears. If male bears can find food from people over the winter, um, they will leave their den occasionally. And uh, our bears are waking up earlier and earlier every year. Um, so last year the bears were awake in mid-February, identified nine individuals that were awake and active in communities where they found food from people. And just yesterday I got that first call from West Vancouver. Uh, so we know that uh, the season is very, very long here on the North Shore. That winter dormancy is a very short period, but it's an important time. Bears aren't true hibernators, so when they go into that winter den, they're not in a deep sleep. Uh, they're in a light sleep. And uh, that helps them to protect themselves but to threats over the winter. Uh, another active bear or another animal could enter the den. And very commonly what happens as well is uh, bears that den at higher elevations, when the snow starts to mel melt in the late winter and early spring, it will flood and the bear needs to be able to respond quickly, especially if it's a female that's given birth. So all our black bears and grizzlies are born at around the end of January, early February. And uh, a female will only give birth though if she's healthy. So mating season for black bears and grizzlies takes place in the summer. Uh, so May to mid-July typically on the North Shore uh, is when we'll see uh, bears mating. And uh, black bears have got delayed implantation. 
Um, so when the black bear female goes into the den uh, in the early winter period, if she's nice and healthy and nourished, any fertilized eggs will uh, develop into cubs and she'll give birth up to six cubs, but that's, that's the record. Usually we see uh, two or three. Um, but if she's malnourished or perhaps injured, her body knows she's not strong enough to raise cubs that year. She's responsible for feeding them milk and uh, any fertilized eggs, eggs will just absorb. Uh, but if she does give birth, um, she's going to be feeding them her milk up until at least the following fall. And uh, bear milk is like whipping cream. So the cubs when they're born are about the same size as a chipmunk. And in about three months, they'll be the size of a house cat. So they grow quite quickly. Uh, so usually the first bears that we do see on the North Shore uh, to emerge from the dens are males, bigger and stronger. Many of them will have been active uh, periodically as well over the late winter. Um, but how do we know if it's a male or female? Uh, well, again, never encouraging you to get close for that look, um, but just some things to look for. Uh, so if it's a, a bear with cubs, then that will always be a female. She's responsible for so, uh, solely responsible for raising those cubs. Um, things that we can look for with males. So male bears will fight other males uh, and that could be for a female, for a food source, for a home range. And so male bears often have lots of scarring on their face. Uh, they are often bigger, but not always. We've got some uh, very big female bears, especially in the Lynn Valley area. Uh, another thing to look for is bears pee a lot. And uh, when a bear pees, if it goes out the front, then it's a male. If it comes out of the back, then it's a female. And a female bear also has uh, what's called a rope. So it's like twisted fur at the back uh, where the pee has come out. So it sounds kind of gross, but that's something that you can look for. And they definitely pee a lot during uh, close encounters with people. Uh, but that might not be where you want to concentrate uh, your eyes. And uh, the next uh, bears that we see are females with last year's cubs. Uh, so these cubs would have been born uh, the previous January. Uh, they'll leave the den uh, around late April, early May. They'll spend the spring, summer and fall with mom. She'll stay very close, teaches them all about food availability, how to stay safe, how to climb, how to swim. And then the whole family will squeeze into a den for another season. Um, and uh, they'll go into that winter dormancy and then they emerge and these uh, little bears are no longer cubs but they are now yearlings. I just like to call them teenagers. Uh, so these teenage bears will spend about another month with mom before she sends them away and that's called dispersal or family breakup. It's very distressing to see um, and that's because the cubs or the yearlings have no idea what's happening and why. Um, but around uh, late April, early May, what will happen is the mother bear will send these yearlings away. She'll just push them away. She won't tolerate them in her space and they'll cry and they'll whimper. They won't understand. They'll try to come back and she just keeps pushing them away until they get the message. And that's because it's about to be mating season and the dominant bears will be coming, the males will be coming down the mountain in search of females and she needs not only to produce more cubs, but she needs to keep these yearlings safe from those big males who are a real threat to these young bears. Uh, so that's a very, very busy time um, for uh, multiple bears being in the community. So what we'll see sometimes is these teenagers that have been pushed away from mom, if they have a sibling, they might stay together for a year or or two, and we've seen now siblings staying together for three or four years on the North Shore, which is very unique. And also bears are quite social, so they might meet bears uh, that are being pushed away from their mom in other communities, and they all might hang out together for a little while until they eventually separate. And uh, that just helps them during that period uh, of being alone for the first time. Their mom has been uh, there to protect them and to guide them for all that time. Uh, but it is a short time. It's about 18 months uh, that a bear cub spends uh, with its mom. So not much time to learn, which is really important uh, that we try not to interrupt uh, that really valuable time of teaching and learning. And then the last bears that we see, um, so we, we won't know until uh, May um, how many new arrivals we have on the North Shore, but the mums and cubs, they're the last to emerge and that just gives the little cubs time to grow and they'll spend most of their time in May, June, very, very close to the den area 
Um, the mother bear will send the little cubs up into the tree canopy while she forages close by. Um, so a very big misconception about black bear moms is that they're very aggressive. And uh, that's not the case. In fact, uh, statistically, a female black bear with cubs is the least dangerous bear that you will encounter. Uh, their nature is very, very timid. And uh, the way that they avoid uh, confrontation with people it is to retreat and is to hide. Um, sometimes they can't do that though, and we might be in a situation where we've surprised them at close range. Now typically what she'll do, she'll send the cub up into the tree. Uh, she does that by making a clacking noise with her jaw and that cub knows that's a signal to hide. And the mother bear will hide at the base of the tree and be really quiet. If it's a close encounter, um, what she might do, if she can't get that cub up into a tree, she has to kind of stand her ground a little bit. She's going to show you, she's going to communicate that she's really stressed and she's asking for space. And she's going to do that by uh, popping her jaw, like clacking her teeth. She's probably going to drool a lot. If you don't respond and you don't slowly back away, she might feel pressured to swat the ground or even take a step in your direction. That's how she communicates that she's asking for space. So whenever we meet a mother bear or, or any bears, uh, we're just going to initially always be nice and calm, just try and be as calm as you can. Uh, we're going to talk in a nice calm tone and just back away to show that you're not a threat to her and her family. And that's all that the bear wants to see. Black bears rarely make physical contact with people. These animals are in close proximity to people daily on the North Shore for, for much of the year without incident. Uh, they're very tolerant, they're very calm, and they're very peaceful animals. Uh, she won't appreciate you getting close to the cubs intentionally, of course, and that's when we will pressure that kind of defensive behavior uh, where she's drooling a lot, she might make vocalizations, and that's just how she communicates to us, that you're too close to her baby or too close to her. So the way that we communicate is by stepping backwards to show that we're not that threat. So she's got a job to teach this little one everything they need to know, and uh, food is obviously um, a necessity. Now bears aren't always hungry. When they first emerge from their den in the spring, um, they've gone through a period over the winter of not eating. And for some bears that can be up to six months. So when they're in their den, they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't go to the bathroom. So it takes a little while for the metabolism to get going again. Um, black bears are classed as carnivores, but in fact they're omnivores and they eat a whole range of foods. Uh, some animal proteins that they get though, uh, they really like bugs. So you'll see sometimes on the trails or even in the garden where uh, bears have been digging up anthills, they love moths. They'll sometimes hunt for smaller mammals. They'll take advantage of roadkill as well. And of course, uh, salmon in the fall. Uh, so some of us are very fortunate to live next to salmon bearing rivers and creeks um, in the community. So it's, it's normal for us to see bears fishing in areas where people live here on the North Shore. So look out for these uh, seasonal foods. And uh, we should expect to see bears, of course, very, very active in the falls by our rivers and creeks. And then other food sources, so about 80 to 85% of their diet is actually vegetation. They love grass, uh, dandelions and clover. So they're the foods that they're really focused on in the springtime. A lot of these foods grow along the roadside as well. So if you're driving up to Whistler, you might see a bear on, on the roadside grazing. We ask if you see a bear anywhere uh, on, on, as you're driving, not to pull over and, and take pictures, but to slow down and give the bear plenty of space. Uh, if we turn off our engines, we're going to get the bears comfortable around vehicles and that will contribute to them being hit and killed on our roads. Every year on the North Shore, bears are hit and killed uh, on highways and residential areas as well. Uh, we lost uh, two bears uh, to vehicle collisions in West Vancouver last year and three the year before that. Uh, so it's definitely um, something that contributes to, to them being killed on the North Shore as well as um, other human caused uh, reasons. Uh, but look out for these natural foods. So the salmon berries are the first berry that we get on the North Shore. Uh, we've got mountain ash, overleaf blueberries. Uh, so very, very often bears will just be on the other side of the trail uh, foraging. And it's a really important food source for these bears. They can eat 60,000 berries in a single day. Uh, so we do ask uh, that you pick with bears in mind when you're out uh, foraging for your own uh, natural foods. And then things like crab apples, 
Um, that's a fall favorite as well as a salmon. And so you'll get the bears in the crabapple trees in the community as well. So that's a, a very strong attractant. Uh, so just look out for these foods and, and bear in mind that uh, this is what the bears will be foraging on and it's very normal to see bears during the day. Uh, so as I mentioned, fall is a very active time for bears and that's because they need to prepare for that winter dormancy. And uh, as they won't have, be having any food over the winter, they need to eat as much food as possible in the fall. Uh, so in the fall is uh, a period of uh, excessive eating and drinking, uh, it's called hyperphagia, and uh, bears during this period are awake for about 20 hours a day in search of as many calories as possible, and uh, they'll be relying on the fat reserves that they build in the fall well into the following spring. They don't actually start to gain weight until the summer. Um, so it's very, very important time for them. It's the time of year that we see an increase in bear activity in the community as well as they look to gain those extra calories. Um, so September, October, November, very, very busy times uh, for bear sightings on the trails and in the community as well. And in the wild, a bear can live for 25 years or more. Uh, this is a, a fully grown bear eating dandelions. Uh, very sadly though, bears that live closer to people live significantly shorter lives. That is due to vehicle collisions, being killed for finding food from people, um, even poisons and such, uh, high numbers of uh, rodenticides that's having an effect on our wildlife. And we shouldn't think that it's not affecting uh, bears as well. Um, so there are lots of things that contribute to, to the deaths of these animals and uh, very often remember the bears that live closer to people are our juveniles. Uh, so many of our North Shore bears don't even make it to adulthood, which is uh, very, very sad. And uh, but this is beautiful bear and uh, this is in Manning Park. Uh, so let's just talk about when you're spending time in areas where bears live. There might not always be signage to tell you that a bear is being sighted in that community or that park, uh, but wherever you go on the North Shore, it's bear country and we can see them at any time of year, so don't get complacent. Um, we should be looking out for signs that bears have been using the space and so a big uh, indicator, sometimes very big, is bear scat. So very often people don't see the bear that's traveled through their property, but they'll see the scat that they left behind. Uh, so this one next to my boot here is up on Cypress Mountain. This was taken in the spring where bears are eating lots of grasses. Their scat is very black. In the summer when they're eating lots of berries, it can be bright pink and purple. Here we've got one full of uh, Pacific crab apples. Uh, some nice healthy foods here. Uh, this tells us if it's an adult or a cub just based on the size and the diet. Very often I'll find the scat and it's full of plastic and it's full of garbage because when bears eat from garbage cans or organics cans they'll eat absolutely anything that smells like food and so their body gets full of plastic and it's then very hard for them to absorb the healthy nutrients that they need to survive. Um, so it's very very damaging to bears to eat unnatural foods. Uh, if the scat is shiny and wet you know it's fresh and a bear's probably still in the area so if you see areas with an abundance of, of this kind of sign um, and you don't want to meet a bear, um, you should avoid those spaces. Another thing to look for are tracks. It's good when it's raining outside, go out into the forest, it's nice and muddy, or if we've had a light snow, look for bear tracks. Um, so bear tracks, bears have got five toes and five claws. Uh, the claws aren't retractable like a cat, so you do see the claw mark. If you're up in Whistler or Manning Park, and you find a bear track. Um, there is a subtle difference to uh, how the toes are shaped with a grizzly and a black bear, but it's hard to find a clear track. The easiest way to tell the difference would be to look where the claw mark is. So remember, grizzlies have got long claws, and so the, toe mark, the claw mark will register much further away from the toe than it would on a black bear. Black bears have got those very short, sharp claws. So if you see fresh tracks going one way, that's your cue to take a different route and give that bear some space. We don't want to approach these animals intentionally. Other things that we might find uh, are marked trees. So this actually on, on the cedar I found in a residential area in West Vancouver. So when black bears climb trees, it leaves a small mark, but this is deliberate and this is a form of communication. Um, so this is potentially a male bear 
marking the tree, reaching up as high as he can to mark the tree to signal to other females he's in the area. Um, and so bears will leave these scent markings. So if you find these marked trees, take a picture, but we ask that you don't touch them. You'll take away the bear's message. Remember bears are driven by their nose. And so the bears will go to these scent markings. You'll see those videos too, where the bears uh, rub their backs on trees. And uh, sometimes that's just for an itch, but very often it's to leave their scent behind. And so young bears, in the area will smell this and know a big male, male bear is in the area and they know to move on. So this is how bears talk to each other. Uh, they leave these marks on trees. You might see shredded logs too. Skunks will do this on a small scale, but if it's a big shredded log, it's usually a bear that's used their canine teeth and their claws to look for bugs. So when we're moving through areas where bears live, it's really important to be present. So not looking at your phone the whole time and just be looking out for these clues, looking out for bears, but be looking out for the fresh pile of scat and all that will help you to avoid a close surprise encounter. Um, be aware of other wildlife as well. So uh, very often when there's a cougar or a coyote or a bear close by, uh, the ravens and even the stellar jays and the crows will be very, very vocal. So if you hear that noise or commotion up ahead of you, maybe just take a different route that day. Um, very often um, for bears, I feel very bad for them. They've got the ravens and the crows following them all the time. So if I lose sight of a bear in the community, I'm listening for two things, the garbage can tipping over and I'm using the ravens and the crows to let me know where that bear is as well. So they're a great uh, indicator for bigger wildlife in the community. A bee herd is really important. The best tool that you've got is your voice. Bears are very intelligent animals. They recognize human voices. They don't know what we're saying. They don't know English, so we can speak in any language. But make sure that you're making noise as you move through the trails. It just means talking to each other. If you hike alone, talk to the birds and the squirrels. And especially if you're walking by a river or a creek or in a narrow overgrown area, you want to be a little bit louder. You want to call out often and uh, be slower as you move through those areas as well, just to give the animal an opportunity to avoid you. Very often what will happen with bears, if they hear people coming, they'll step off the trail. And uh, what you might see is if you walk past, the, you'll walk on the trail, you might turn behind you and the bears out, out just behind you. Um, and that's because they've waited for you to pass. They very often yield to people, uh, not always, but they do spend a lot of time doing that. Um, a bear might also scale a tree um, if they hear you. And again, that avoids that close encounter. So staying on established trails is really important so we don't damage sensitive habitat. And as I mentioned before, bears can be just off the trail, um, eating or sometimes resting as well. Uh, they'll, they'll rest very, very close to busy areas. Uh, they like to rest at the base of cedar trees, lots of shade there in the summer. Uh, very hard to see them, they're, they're very camouflaged in the forest. Um, and staying on established trails um, means that we need to keep our dogs on the trails as well. Uh, so keeping dogs on leash is very, very important. Uh, more than half of all negative uh, encounters between people and wildlife involve off-leash dogs because the dogs go off trail, they disturb and pressure the bear, the bear feels as if it needs to defend itself, and sometimes the bear will chase the dog and the dog will very often run back to the owner. And that's when people and bears have these close encounters. Um, so bears um, on the North Shore, for the most part, are quite okay with dogs in the sense that they're not responding in any kind of aggressive way. They're very tolerant um, and they're very used to seeing and encountering dogs on the trails. So we don't expect them to run away. It's illegal to allow your dog to chase the bear. Remember, we don't want bears to be afraid of dogs that could pressure uh, future uh, defensive encounters, uh, but it's really, really important to keep your dog on leash to keep everybody uh, nice and safe. Uh, so we never want to leave, leave any food unattended, not even just for a moment. So don't, you know, go and put the cooler on the picnic table and then go back to the parking lot and leave it unattended. Now it's very rare for bears to approach people for food, but they will take the opportunity if people aren't close by. So what we've seen sadly over the past few years with more people spending time in our parks is more people leaving food unattended and then our bears gaining access to this unnatural food. And so bears are even killed in the forest if they find food from people. 
So it might be your cooler, might be a backpack, never leave anything um, out of reach. Always keep it very close by. And if you're taking food out into the forest, it's best to use uh, uh, airtight containers as well, just to reduce the odor as much as possible. And uh, if you do like to go out into the backcountry and even on the local trails, we do recommend um, carrying wildlife spray or known as bear spray, um, but it is effective on other wildlife too. And so bear spray or wildlife spray is a very, very strong pepper spray. It's designed uh, for bears and cougars. It uh, contains capsaicin, which is incredibly hot pepper. And um, it's a deterrent. It's only to be used um, in a very rare situation. We have a close encounter with a bear and the bear does not leave. Um, in those kind of situations, you would deploy this spray into the bear's face, always in, uh, into the bear's face. And uh, this spray is so effective because their sense of smell is so keen. So it's more effective at deterring an approaching bear than a gun would be. And it's non-lethal as well. So it teaches that bear not to approach people. And uh, in some cases, very rare situations, it saved people's lives. So it's an excellent tool. Now I've had hundreds of encounters with black bears in all sorts of situations. Um, I've moved them away from food sources. Um, I've had very, very close surprise encounters and I've never ever had to deploy my bear spray. So it's one of those things that you probably will never have to use it, but it's good to have and it's good to know how to use it. So there is more information on our website on bear spray and we do recommend carrying that here on the North Shore. Uh, so bears in the neighborhood. Um, so uh, the call today, uh, yesterday, sorry about the bear in the community, uh, was in fact that the, it was assumed that the bear had actually denned very close to a residential area. And uh, it's very normal for us to see bears traveling through residential areas here on the North Shore. They often have no choice uh, but to travel through the community in search of the next river or green space. Uh, but we need to do our very best to make sure that we don't invite them to stay. And we set boundaries from a safe place if we see bears in the community. They're very intelligent, teachable animals and we can teach them where it's not acceptable to be. And close to homes isn't safe for anybody, especially our bears. As I said, encounters between people and black bears, negative encounters, physical encounters, exceptionally rare. Um, but the consequence for bears is deadly when they find food in the community. If you see a trap like this, this is set by uh, the government agency, the Conservation Officer Service, uh, and they manage our wildlife here on the North Shore and across British Columbia, of course. Their role is not to conserve the lives of bears, it's public safety. And uh, unfortunately, many people believe that when a bear finds an unnatural food source like garbage or a bird feeder, they get addicted to that food. And it's absolutely not the case. Studies have shown that bears prefer natural foods, but of course, like any wild animal, they will take food that is available to them. Now, these traps uh, are baited with garbage and molasses, and when the bear is trapped, uh, the bear is taken to another location, and very often the bear will be killed. So across British Columbia, every year between 500 and 600 black bears are killed. Uh, last year on the North Shore, seven bears were killed. Um, and so a couple of situations where a bear will definitely be killed are if they've entered a property or a confined space. That confined space could be an empty open garage, uh, could be an empty shed. Uh, but if the bears enter that confined space, that's not tolerated by the conservation officers. A trap will be set and the bear will be killed. Um, another situation is any kind of property damage that's reported to them, uh, again, not tolerated. And of course, if, if there was any kind of physical injury to a person, that behavior wouldn't be tolerated. Very rarely, very rarely, there might be a short distance relocation where the bears move from the community to a green space. That green space could be two kilometers away, and it's not really to give the bear a chance, the bear will come back. It's to give residents in the community an opportunity to secure what was attracting the bear in the first place. Now, what we see every year on the North Shore is that within days of a bear being killed in an area, another bear will take its place. We have to end this cycle of tempting bears into the community with food, allowing them to be killed, and then repeating the cycle over and over again. Um, we can peaceably coexist with these animals. It just takes a little bit of effort on our part. 
And uh, a big piece is securing our garbage. So anything odorous uh, is going to be very interesting to a bear. So garbage, organics are the strongest, most commonly reported attractants. Um, some of you live in West Vancouver, um, where you might have small organics carts. We really recommend that you keep them inside your home or a, a garage or a very, very secure shed. Um, what we can do with our organics too is freeze anything odorous and uh, that will help to reduce, um, uh, we'll keep the carts clean as well and uh, put out those fr frozen items on the very morning of collection. So we have bylaws across uh, the North Shore um, about garbage set out times. So nobody, no matter where you live on the North Shore, you're not permitted to put garbage or organics or recyclables out at curbside until the morning of pickup. And there is enforcement for that now. Uh, so we're really um, very happy uh, to work with the bylaw departments and, and all um, the different departments of the, of, uh, the municipalities. Um, and we've really seen um, a huge increase um, in education and enforcement from the municipalities. And that really shows the community that uh, they value the lives of these animals and they're important uh, members of our wider community that we need to take care of. And uh, of course, we do want to reduce the number of times that people open their door and, and see if a bear on the porch in the morning, most people wouldn't want to see that. Um, so it does, of course, um, hugely um, reduce the, the amount of time that bears spend in the community if we don't provide them with food. Um, so things uh, that are very um, attractive to bears would be um, meat and fish and bones. And uh, then in the garbage, it would be things like uh, dirty diapers. So if you've got anything like that, it needs to be stored inside uh, your home or garage always. And uh, if you live in the district of North Vancouver, we've got the lockable carts. As you can see, they're not bear proof in any way. They're bear resistant, but our bears can get into them very easily. So we do um, ask you to please keep those inside uh, a garage or secure shed as well. And then bird feeders, a very strong attractant. Um, so bird feeders, especially the seeds and suets, thousands of calories. Um, this is often the first thing that the bear will find in the community um, is they'll find the bird feeders over the winter. They do contribute to a lot of uh, our late winter activity. And then when the bird feeder is being destroyed, uh, the bear will find the garbage and maybe pet food, maybe a dirty barbecue. Um, so very, very strong attractants. For such agile climbers, it's almost impossible to hang a bird feeder where a bear can't access it. We've had situations in West Vancouver where a bear's been on the roof of somebody's property um, to access a bird feeder. So we ask that you don't hang bird feeders in bear country. If you want to feed the birds, we suggest putting a very small amount of seed on a plate when you're home to enjoy the birds and, and then bring that inside. Uh, but these, these kind of feeders, even the hummingbird feeders, it's like a Red Bull energy drink for the bears, nice and sugary, they love that. Uh, that will bring a bear much, much too close to your house. Uh, so please don't hang these in uh, bear habitat. And then fruit trees. Goodness me, bears love any kind of fruit. So fruit trees, the bird feeders, the garbage, organics are the strongest attractants. And bears have got excellent memories. They will remember exactly where your fruit tree is, when that fruit is ripe. It's incredible. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we prune our trees at this time of year to reduce the amount of fruit that they produce, makes nice healthier fruit too. And anything that's fallen to the ground needs to be collected daily. If you can't manage a fruit tree uh, here in, in bear country, we do advise removing it and replacing it with a, a non-bearing fruit tree. You can install electric fencing if you like to grow fruit, um, but you need to make sure there are no access points like branches or fences. But electric fencing is an excellent way uh, when it's maintained uh, to keep a bear away from something. It doesn't hurt them, doesn't hurt us, uh, but it teaches that bear to avoid that space. So if you've got chickens, um, if you've got small pets that live outside, rabbits, guinea pigs, electric fencing is absolutely key. It might also be mandatory in your municipality as well. So chickens and chicken feed, um, more people are, are, are inviting us into the community and they're very, very strong attractants. Other foods, uh, so outdoor fridges and, and freezers, every single year uh, we get reports of bears being killed because they're finding outdoor freezers. So they remember their sense of smell is excellent. 
Um, freezers aren't designed to be bear proof, even with chains on, the bear can access these. So these need to be kept inside a secure uh, garage or very, very secure shed. Uh, compost, you absolutely can compost in bear country, but you just need to uh, make sure they aerate often, add lots of uh, um, brown uh, materials just to reduce odour as much as possible. And we don't want to put eggshells in there. Um, that is uh, a bear attractant, so we can uh, put everything else in there that you usually would in the compost, but oils, dairy, um, avoid those. Pet food. Uh, so bears don't come into the community looking to eat cats and dogs. They really don't see them as a food source, uh, but pet food is highly attractive to them. Uh, so feed your pets inside always and don't store uh, pet food in, in sheds that aren't secure. Um, again, this is something that comes up almost every year. Um, sometimes when a bear is more persistent at gaining entry to space, and that could be a garage that's not got a very secure door, if it's a very thin vinyl door, or a shed that's not very secure and the bear is able to access that, uh, well, they've accessed a confined space, they've caused property damage, that bear is going to be killed. It's not a good situation for you to be in as well. Most people wouldn't want to be in a situation where they've got a bear on their property and inside a confined space. Um, the bear would just leave once, once they'd eaten the food, but they would come back. Uh, but things like pet food, um, very highly odorous, and this is when we see them being more persistent. Um, things like uh, fish fertilizer as well and grease from meats. Um, if you're storing those in unsecure places, you should expect um, bears to be trying to gain access to, to that because it's so odorous to them. Um, dirty barbecues, so we need to clean the barbecue grill and grease trap every single time and don't leave food unattended outside even on the deck. Uh, make sure that you make uh, always with that food when you're cooking the food, when you're having food outside. Um, remember bears are passing through the community Again, every summer I get calls from people who are outside having food and a bear's wander through the garden and uh, approach the table. Um, if you're in that kind of situation, what we want to do is actually use our human dominance uh, to teach the bear that that's not acceptable. So what you would do in a situation if you're having food outside and the bear comes into the garden, what you'd want to do, get children and pets inside and then uh, any adults stand outside, you want to stand up, you use a firm tone of voice, bears are very intelligent and understand tone over volume, and you just tell that bear to move on. And they're very, very intelligent. Remember, they're gonna listen, they're not looking to get into a kind of confrontation, and that prevents that bear from accessing that unnatural food source, and it teaches that bear not to approach people. So if you do feel comfortable doing that, that's the best thing that you can do, rather than you know going inside and allowing the bear to eat the food. Um, every year, again, um, it's a very busy uh, place to be on the North Shore for bear activity. Last year, we got, I think, um, almost 1,200 reports. Um, so it was a very busy year and uh, lots of different scenarios were going on. Very often what happens is people will be out in the garden and they'll just come inside and the bear will walk through the garden. And uh, that's because the bear knew that they were there and is trying to avoid them. And that's why um, very often that happens. Uh, but it's really important that we keep uh, windows uh, and, and garages and lower level doors closed unless we're in the immediate area because these animals are quite curious and we have had situations especially last year during the heat wave uh, where bears entered properties. Um, situations like something from a cartoon where a lady was um, cooling a pie in the kitchen and the door was wide open and the bear walked in and took the pie. Uh, well, that's a situation where the, the homeowner actually was uh, not afraid. She could tell that the bear was, was very calm and uh, just after that food source, but uh, a situation where a trap was set and the bear was killed. Um, so making sure that uh, you, you're in, in the room if the door is open uh, to deter and uh, inviting somebody else in. And then I did just cover that, but uh, beehives as well, chickens need to be secured with electric fencing. These are very, very strong attractants. And then petroleum products, um, keeping those things stored inside a garage or shed uh, rather than outside of your property. And food in vehicles. So um, 
Bears are very, very good at finding even a small amount of food. So it might be a stick of gum or a granola bar. Um, you need to make sure that your vehicles are free of food and garbage. If you do have to store any kind of food or garbage in your vehicle, leave it in the trunk and uh, keep the windows and the doors locked. Uh, bears can open car doors. And uh, if a bear enters a vehicle, we had this happen last year, um, we had the situation where there were granola bars left in the car, the bear went into the car and the door closed behind them, the bear was trapped for about 20 minutes, um, wrote off the car, the car was completely destroyed because of course the bear's long claws and the teeth and the bear was terrified and trying to exit the vehicle. And what happened in that situation, it was very early in the morning and uh, the homeowners very gingerly stepped out and opened the door and the bear bolted. That's a negative experience that that bear has had. The granola bar is not worth that experience. So we didn't see that repeated behavior. Uh, they're smart and, and they don't want to get into negative situations like that. Um, but if it's easy and they can just pop in and out and grab the food, we're gonna see a repeat of that behavior uh, that nobody wants to see. And then food deliveries, making sure that if you're having food uh, dropped off, that there's somebody here to bring it inside or uh, a neighbor or a secure place to make sure that you're not leaving food set out of your home all day or night. And then Halloween treats too. So balls of candy and even pumpkins uh, will bring bears much close uh, to your house than I'm sure you would like. Uh, so make sure that we display pumpkins inside and uh, don't leave uh, food uh, the candy outside, always make sure that that's inside. Um, so these are just some of the very common attractants that we see over the course of the season that are bringing bears close to homes um, that are um, contributing to the bears being killed in the community as well. So I did mention about setting boundaries uh, with these very teachable animals. Um, so if you're in a situation where a bear is on your property and you're inside and you can go to a safe place like a deck or a window, um, we don't want you to stand there filming for a long time, maybe take a quick picture, we know it might be exciting, but what we want to do is teach that bear not to get comfortable. And so what we need to do is use again our human dominance, and that's our voice, and we're going to use a firm tone of voice. When you're in a safe place with a bear, you can make eye contact. And uh, what you would do is you go to the deck or the window and just be very, very persistent with that firm tone of voice, making eye contact. You can clap if you want as well. Some people will bang pots and pans. But what we've seen over the course of the past few years is that air horns and pots and pans aren't as effective as they used to be because bears are uh, becoming accustomed to those loud noises, but human voices they recognize and tone of a volume they recognize. So nice, firm, harsh tone, and just in keep encouraging the bear to move. Don't expect them to run, but don't expect them to stay and get comfortable if you're encouraging them to leave. And that's the best thing that we can do. Now, if the bear is eating something on your property, it's gonna be impossible almost uh, to move them on. You can try with your voice, but don't expect them uh, to leave that food source. Um, so wait until they've finished eating and then go in with that firm tone of voice and eye contact from a safe place. And then of course, remove or secure what was ever attracting the bear in the first place. So that's the best thing that we can do for these animals. Uh, so if we have a close encounter, and this can happen, it can happen in residential areas, it can happen on the trails, uh, maybe the bear's been focused on eating, wasn't quite sure uh, that you were there, we can have these very close encounters. Um, there are three things to remember, and uh, the first thing to do is to stay nice and calm. So by nature, bears, black bears are calm and peaceful animals. So if we stay nice and calm, it helps the bear to stay calm as well. Remember the bear might need a moment just to figure out what's going on. They might stand up. Remember that's not an aggressive posture, it's curiosity. So just take that deep breath to try and stay nice and calm. Remember, nice and calm with your body as well. And then we're gonna use our voice to talk to the bear. And remember, this is the best tool that you've got, identifies you as a person. And also what we do when we use our voice, um, we're gonna use a nice calm tone. And that calm tone communicates to that bear that you're not a danger to them. So when we talk to the bear, we want to look at them to focus our attention on what they're up to, but we don't want to stare eye to eye when we're having a close encounter. Um, that uh, could be uh, read as, as a threat or as a challenge by the bear. So focus your attention on their chest or on their legs. 
It's absolutely fine if you look them in the eye for a second or two, that's fine, but focus your attention on their chest and calmly talk to that bear. So think about what you might want to say to the bear um, is what I'll say to, to the kids. Um, that calm tone of voice, hey bear, nice to see you there, whatever you might want to say. And as you're talking to the bear, you, you slowly back away. So remember nice and slow, calm movements. We're not gonna make ourselves look big. We don't need to be really loud because what we want to do is communicate. I'm giving you space, I'm giving you respect. I'm not a danger to you. So you back away to put that distance between you and the bear and to make sure that you can see what the bear is up to as well. So stay nice and calm, use a calm tone of voice and back away and give that bear space. Now there might be situations where a bear is walking towards you or it appears that they're walking towards you. Very often the bear just wants to take the route that you are on and uh, maybe they've been pushed by another bear or by people or they just have been yielding to people all day and they've got somewhere to be and some bears remember are quite comfortable with people at a distance and that distance like for us that personal space is different for every individual bear which is why we never step towards them always back away um, but if a bear is walking towards you and the bear isn't looking at you they're looking to the side they're looking beyond you um, what you can do in that situation then, because you know that the bear isn't focused and intent on approaching you, it's just trying to get somewhere, you do the same thing. Give the bear as much space as possible and allow them to pass. In a very rare situation when a bear is focused on you, and this is usually curious teenage bears, and they're looking at you, they're wanting to get close to you for some reason. As I said, it could be curiosity, it could be trying to push you away from a space, we don't want bears to push us around like that. We need to teach them that they can't do that. So if a bear comes close to you and is focused on you, they're approaching your personal space, this is when you need to be brave. It's very rare that this happens, but you need to stand your ground, make yourself look big, make eye contact and use a firm tone. Hey, no, teach the bear not to get into your personal space. And curious black bear behavior is to get that too close and when you use that firm tone, they understand and they respond and they back away. It's a great time to bring out your bear spray in that situation as well. Now I said that's very rare, but it can sometimes happen. Most common scenario is just to stay calm, talk in any language in a calm tone and back away. Uh, let's just move on now quickly to coyotes. So um, coyotes are active uh, year round and uh, most visible actually in the late winter. And in the spring, um, it's mating season for them right now. So uh, during the winter months, uh, coyotes are actually quite small, um, quite scrawny, but they get a nice thick winter coat and they look very big and healthy. Lots of people think they look like wolves. Um, so they're more visible at this time of year. And as it, it's mating season, they're out in search of a mate. Uh, so we'll see uh, multiple coyotes. And it's normal now during the winter to see them during the daytime. Uh, for the rest of the season, they're typically more active at dusk and dawn. Um, but uh, these animals are omnivores as well, so they eat most things. Um, they'll climb into a fruit tree and eat fruit. Uh, they actually are um, a risk to black bear cubs and uh, other small mammals. Most of what they eat uh, is, is other animal protein, but they do eat garbage, they do eat fruit. Um, so there's lots of food sources around the community for them. Um, so it benefits uh, coyotes to live a little bit closer to people uh, because around people there are often lots of rats. So if you live near a creek or if you've got unsecured garbage, lots of spilled bird seed, that's going to attract rodents. And uh, rats make up about 75% of a coyote's diet. Uh, so in fact, it's a really good thing to have them around. It helps to control uh, the rat population. Um, coyotes um, are uh, very active at this time of year, remember, um, so the, the, they're mating and then what will happen is um, the female of the, of the mating couple will actually go into a den and that den again can be very, very close to the community, it could be uh, in one of our parks, uh, golf courses are a great place because uh, of all the rodents as well. Uh, small forested areas next to residential areas are, are often a place where coyotes will den because there's an abundance of food there. Um, and it's safe as well without as many people going through like it would be on the trails. And um, 
the female will give birth to pups in the spring, usually around six pups. And the male's responsibility during that period is to bring food back to his family. And this is what he's looking out for uh, mostly is rats. Um, so to reduce coyote activity close to homes, uh, we need to make sure that we're not attracting rodents. So picking up that fallen fruit, remember the coyote will eat fruit as well, but the fruit attracts the rodents and that brings the coyotes. Um, fallen bird seed, so bird seed always spills to the ground and uh, bird seed attracts a lot of different critters and uh, of course our garbage as well, making sure that your garbage cans are nice and clean and secure. That will all help to reduce activity close to your home. We need to be mindful of our pets as well. Um, so um, coyotes will of course see cats and small unattended dogs as a, as a food source. So we do recommend keeping cats inside here on the North Shore at all times of year, day and night. Um, so you can get nice fancy catios now, you can train your cats to go out on leash like I do, they can still enjoy the outside, uh, but it's safer for them. So remember coyotes and other animals that eat uh, our domestic pets, uh, such as cougars and even bobcats, can be active during the day. So just bringing the pets in at night isn't the solution. Um, so just to keep everybody safe, we do recommend keeping cats inside. Um, so just some tips on how to see if you've got coyote activity. So it's a lot easier to look for these animal tracks once it's snowed or if it's been raining, as I said, it's nice and muddy. So coyote track, very similar to a dog track, uh, only the track uh, is much narrower. Uh, the front two claws of a coyote track are, are very narrow, um, whereas a dog's claw marks are very wide and, and spread apart. Um, so you'll see these um, around the community quite often. Um, coyotes um, are pretty timid and quite shy and uh, they're very good at hiding. So um, many people will live with coyotes very, very in close proximity to them, but they won't see them, uh, but we'll often find the tracks. And uh, coyote scat. Uh, so coyotes will mark their territory on trails, um, especially during mating season and uh, during that time when they're taking care of the pups and uh, they're really trying to alert other dogs not to use that space or to, to give them uh, that space. And they're trying to set those boundaries with our domestic pets who are a danger to them. Um, and so coyote scat, uh, you'll find on the trail sometimes, it's usually very, very dry because of all the, the fur from uh, the rodents that they eat, very twisted. You'll see some bone in there as well. Um, so that's what that looks like. And uh, as I said, they are very timid. Um, they have some strange behaviors that people will interpret as aggressive behavior, uh, but it's not. It's again, curiosity. Um, so coyotes do stare a lot and that's not a threatening stare. It's really just to see what you're up to. Are you gonna get close to a food source that they might be protecting? Are you gonna get close to their pups? Uh, what they'll do as well very often, very often it's people with dogs that will encounter coyotes. So that's why again, always recommending keeping dogs on a nice close leash um, that will help to reduce close encounters with people and wildlife as well and keep our pets and wild animals safe. Um, but coyotes will like to guide you away from an area. So they do follow people with dogs and that's quite normal behavior. It's not with an intent to make contact, but it's to push you away from a space. Uh, so the best thing is to just comply and walk away. Now, if a bear, if a Coyote approaches you though at very, very close range and they're intent on you, they're focused on you. Um, it's very rare for that to happen, um, but all we need to do is use a loud, firm voice. You can clap, you can stomp on the ground and they'll usually run away. Um, they are very shy. Whenever you see a coyote, um, if you see um, them in the community, you should always do that. Just clap and use your voice and just tell them to move on. Nothing too aggressive. Remember, we don't want to be causing them to feel defensive around people, but just setting those boundaries of uh, not being, uh, not getting close to people. And then cougars. So our biggest uh, wild cat here on the North Shore. So we have cougars and we have bobcats. Uh, cougars are very elusive, um, very, very rarely seen. Uh, most cougar reports turn out to be coyotes. 
Um, but of course, they, they do live here on the North Shore. People do see them, certainly with the increase of uh, security cameras that people have around homes. Uh, that's contributing to an increase in reports of, of all wildlife, uh, but has picked up some cougars in the community as well. Um, so cougars are typically nocturnal. Uh, they like to come out very late at night to avoid people. Uh, so we might see those cougar reports coming on for 2, 3 a.m. That's quite a common time. Uh, but it, they can be seen during the daytime as well. Uh, these animals are active year round. Um, we do receive typically, not this year, uh, but typically an increase in, in cougar reports over the late winter. And uh, a couple of reasons for that, just they're more visible against the landscape. And also they're following uh, their main food source to lower elevations. Um, and so we see an increase in cat activity around residential areas, usually bobcats uh, and occasionally cougars over the winter. And their main food source is deer. So when deer travel down to lower elevations to find uh, the grasses where the, we have no snow, that's when we'll get the, the cougars coming into the community. And so you might have situations too where um, much like vulnerable bears, deer will congregate in, in busy spaces. Um, maybe if you're up at Rice Lake, uh, there are lots of deer around the picnic area and that's not because they want the picnic food, but maybe there's a cougar close by that they're trying to avoid. So again, seeking safety a little bit around people. And that's why we see deers in residential areas as well. It's a little bit safer uh, if they're trying to avoid a cougar. Um, so a, 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 an adult cougar will eat uh, one deer, one adult deer about every two to three weeks and they'll cache their food. So if you ever see any dead wildlife in the forest, uh, make sure that you back away nice and slowly and leave the area. If you're in one of our parks, let's let one of the rangers know. Um, they can just monitor that area. It could be a cougar cache. Usually what they'll do with that animal kill is they'll um, cover it with branches and leaves to, to kind of cover that up. And it's rare to find them, but certainly don't approach any dead wildlife in the forest. Um, and snowshoe hair is on the menu as well. And then these are the uh, smaller mammals. So again, another reason why we don't want to be uh, encouraging rodents and raccoons uh, into the community with food, that brings coyotes that predate on, on the raccoons. It brings cougars that predate on the raccoons. Uh, so feeding of wildlife uh, really uh, has a huge impact and brings many more animals than people would uh, intend uh, into the community. So this is why we don't want to feed any of our, uh, our wildlife. As tempting, as cute as the raccoons are when they put their hands like this, we don't want to encourage them. Raccoons are actually uh, a danger to cats and small dogs uh, as well. So uh, don't, don't encourage them. And again, like with, uh, with the coyotes keeping pets inside that will uh, help to reduce cougar activity close to homes. Um, they are opportunities, sadly, for, for those wild animals and they will bring them into the community. And again, with dogs, uh, dogs and cougars, um, keeping your dog in a nice close leash so that uh, that dog doesn't pressure kind of defensive behavior, maybe from a mother cougar or is not seen as a food source. And again, if you're walking with dogs, we really recommend that you take in bear spray with you as well. It's effective on cougars too. Uh, so cougar tracks. Um, uh, so no claw marks, uh, so cats have got retractable claws, a um, little bit different from a dog track uh, in the sense that a dog track or a canine track has got uh, two lobes at the bottom. You can see here that uh, the cougar track has got three lobes at the bottom of the paw pad and two at the top. Um, quite hard to find these tracks, but I do find them where I am uh, in the Indian River area quite often. And uh, scat, if you've had the pleasure of cleaning a cat litter tray, uh, bobcat and cougar scat is very similar to domestic cat scat, very segmented, um, lots of big bones usually in the cat scat. They're able to digest much bigger bones than a coyote. It's usually full of fur as well from the deer. Uh, so look out for these signs. And if you were to ever meet a cougar, it would be exceptionally rare, but in most situations, um, if a cougar uh, is visible to you and you see that cougar, the cougar will usually run. They're very, very, very shy and encounters between people and cougars are exceptionally rare. We don't hear about 
uh, close encounters at all uh, to the society over the 15 years that, that we've been running the society. We've not heard about any close encounters, any negative encounters. Um, but uh, if you were to spot one of these cats, uh, what you want to do is actually use your voice again. Remember, very, very good tool that you won't leave at home. Uh, you want to use a nice firm voice. And with a cougie, you want to be always backing away as well. So don't stand still, always be moving away from that cougar. Now, if the cougar doesn't run and the cougar approaches you, you've got to be very, very brave. And uh, remember that cougar attacks on people are exceptionally rare um, over the course of a hundred year period across North America. Uh, I think it's around 30 people have been killed by cougars. So, um, so many opportunities and it's not in their nature. Uh, those attacks were anomalies. Um, but if a cougar does approach you, that's when you need to make yourself look really big. You maintain eye contact and you use a deep, firm voice and you continue to back away. You would also use and deploy the bear spray as well, or the wildlife spray if the cougar got uh, within close range. And if the cougar ever made physical contact, you would fight back with all that you had and aim for the eyes and the nose, the most sensitive part of the cat. But hopefully you will never need to know that. And uh, you probably walk past cougars in the forest uh, more times than you know without ever seeing them. I look for these animals often. There are people that research cougars that have never seen them in the wild. I've never seen one, but I do find a scat. I've been woken up by a cougar call uh, in the forest behind me at night, uh, a mating call one winter. Um, and so they are around, uh, but very rarely seen. Uh, so thank you so much um, for your, uh, your time this evening. I do welcome any questions that you might have uh, and I'm very grateful um, for you uh, for joining me this evening. And thank you again to West Vancouver Library. Excellent, thank you so much. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please go ahead and type those into the Q&A. And we do have a few more minutes. We have a, a couple minutes for questions. Um, I'm just curious to know if you're traveling with small children, so if you're out hiking or you're out in the community and you have small children, are any of these animals more likely to become aggressive or more likely to attack if you have a small person with you? Well, not that we've heard of on the North Shore, but certainly cougars um, are more of a risk to small children. And that's because um, small children are a little bit it's sad to say like cougar prey, they make high pitched noises and they're running fast and they trigger that chase instinct. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. If you've got small children and you're out on the trails, keep them nice and close, always keep them uh, close and in front of you and uh, teach your children what to do if they see a bear as well. So you can practice as a family. And what you should always do um, is have one person designated to be talking to that bear so that you're not all trying to tell the bear a story at the same time. And uh, when you're going out as a family before that hike, okay, mom's going to talk to the bear today if we see a bear on the trail. And what's she going to say? And just practice with your family so that they know uh, what to do and they feel comfortable should that situation happen. That's good to know. Um, I think we do have a question, but um, I can't answer um, a raised hand. So if you can just type your question into the Q&A on the bottom of your screen, uh, that would be great. You know, someone did raise their hand, so hopefully you can uh, type the question into the Q&A. Um, so what happens if multiple people are talking all at the same time? So you said it's good if just one person is the sort of designated talker. Oh, it's just easier, especially if you have small children, just to make sure that um, the bear's not too confused and they can just kind of focus on, on, on one, one person and they're listening to that one voice. And then with children, they might be screaming or, or shouting so you want to really teach your children if you're in a situation when you're meeting a bear or another animal on the trail you guys are going to be nice and quiet and we're going to have mom or dad or whoever it might be is going to talk to the animal today and we're going to talk in this nice calm voice because with bears as well remember in, in most situations you want to communicate nice and calm and people scream and they run away from bears all the time but that's not what we want to do we want to really try and and teach these animals that um, we're a bit more predictable and when you encounter us we're going to be nice and calm we're going to show you we're going to give you space 
I think, yeah, we're, we're much more unpredictable uh, than most of the animals that we'll encounter on the trail, that's for sure. And they're getting mixed messages from people all the time. So you don't know what experience that bear just had. I'll have people that call me that say they launched bear bangers on the trail because they wanted to mountain bike and the bear was eating berries. So that bear is just being harassed and, and scared away by a pyrotechnic and, and pushed into your path. And then you're screaming and all big and in their faces. It's not that it would uh, potentially create a negative situation, but it just, it's, it's harassment to the animals. And we want you to, to feel comfortable as well and knowing that we don't need to be big. We don't need to scream and, and be aggressive towards these animals. Uh, it should be, um, get your heart racing a little bit, that's for sure, but a nice, calm, pleasant experience. Good, thank you. All um, right, so a question here. I often hike alone and I occasionally hit my hiking poles together. Is this enough? Um, I would say using your voice is mu much better um, because a, a bear or another animal can identify that sound as human. Um, so making noise all the time with, with doing things like that as you're moving around, but you making sure that you're talking out loud as well. So I, I hike alone as well a lot. And it's always when I'm talking out loud, like to the bushes, hey bear, hey cougar. That's always when I bump into someone after not seeing someone for a little while. <laughs> uh, but that's just how it is. And you might feel a little bit silly, but um, it's just best to use your voice and talk to the birds. Okay. Um, what if a bear is making huffing noises at you? Again, that's just a, a way that a bear communicates that they want space. So you've surprised them, you've stressed them out. Um, and they're asking you to, to move away. Um, so huffing noises, when bears drool a lot, um, that's stress signals, that's I'm stressed, you're too close, you just surprised me. And uh, all we need to do is communicate, I'm gonna give you that space. Great. Um, do you recommend bear bells? I don't recommend bear bells. That's probably the first thing I bought when I moved to Canada. I thought it was really cool, uh, but they're pretty useless. Um, actually, the sound doesn't travel very far and, again, doesn't identify you as a person. So your voice really is best. Interesting. Okay, good to know. Um, and so if you do see any of these animals, um, who is it best to call? Is it best to call you? Is it best to call the Conservation Society? What's the best course of action? Well, of course, I will say that I prefer you to call the North Shore Black Bear Society mm -hmm. because... Um, We've got extensive uh, knowledge on bear behavior that we'll be able to share with you. We can also share resources with the community and we work with our parks departments as well. So we can make sure that everybody in those areas is aware of, of the activity and uh, it helps us to collect that very valuable data um, so that we can do our outreach and make sure that uh, the animals and uh, the residents and visitors are, are comfortable and safe. So we would prefer you to reach out to us, but uh, that's your choice. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lucy, for your time and for being with us tonight. I'm so grateful. This was um, so fascinating for me as well. I did not grow up in bear country, so this is uh, really interesting to me. I did grow up in cougar country, but we call them mountain lions in California. Same animal. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. I'm so grateful to everyone. And we will um, post this presentation on our YouTube channel so you can um, pick up any of the details that you might have missed. And again, thank you, Lucy. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening.